So, I'll go ahead and get started on my sermon here. Now, um, God has been bringing us on a journey ever since the beginning of the year. And um, it's, always, it's always been about growing, I know that. It's always been about growing spiritually, learning about the Word of God and all that and everything. But I've never sensed more of a sense of, of preparing us for something like I have during this year. And uh, I really believe that 2024, 2025, and I don't know how, how long but, or whatever, but I just know what I sense in my spirit. And I don't know the longevity of this, but um, I believe that what God's preparing us for is, is an event that's going to take us right to the rapture. I do believe that. And whether that's a year from now or five years from now, I don't know. But I just know that there is an event, and it really has to do with with um, a big revival, a big revival. We've sensed that in our spirits for years. I remember back when we first were, before we even started the church, and that's why we call ourselves Harvest Life Christian Center, we were talking about there's a revival coming to America. And I can remember some pastors that, that I really respect, they were saying, no, no, that's not gonna happen. Uh, there's gonna be a gradual de falling away, falling away of, of, uh, until finally the church is just is, is raptured out. And we just, it never set right with us, it never did. We just kept believing, no, we just really feel in our spirit there's gonna be a big revival come to America. And, and now, the ones that didn't believe it, believe it. Now they're saying the same thing, that yes, they can see that yes, there's gonna be a big revival, amen? Because, but, but if it's all hinged, and you gotta get this as an individual. I'm talking to the congregation, I'm talking to people online, but you have to take this information for yourself exactly as an individual, as if it totally depends on you and you alone. That I'm speaking to you alone, just you. And that's this, you have to decide to stand up and begin to be what God has called you to be. You have to make that decision because we're in a war and, I'm, and, and so when I, at the beginning of the year, I started talking about the principles that would help you succeed in 2024. And all of those principles are basically set up so that you can mature and be a, a, a fully equipped uh, soldier in the army of God. Amen? And that's what it's all about. It's not just so you can be victorious in life, so you don't life, go through life surfing smoothly and all that. You know what, I'm telling you what, if you stand up for Christ and you be all that he's called you to be, I tell you what, life's gonna get rough sometimes because you're gonna have opposition. If you're not having opposition, you're probably not doing anything. Come on, come on, I'm serious. Because, and, and I'm telling you what, it's only gonna ramp up. And I believe that, and that's why I sense that God is, 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 is really equipping his people more and more. Now, I'm not trying to be an alarmist. I'm not trying to say, oh my gosh, it's gonna be so bad, everybody gets scared, go hide under a rock. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying, though, is, is that storms come. Amen? Storms come, and you wanna build your house on a rock. Amen? You wanna build your house on a rock. And so, I know that there's gonna be a lot of awesome opportunities in 24, and those opportunities are gonna be disguised as challenges. They're gonna, your opportunities are gonna be disguised as challenges. You know, and you have to realize that every, every challenge is an opportunity. It's not, it, it's not oh my gosh, this, you know, this is gonna take me out. No, this is an opportunity to be more victori victorious than you were before. Come on, because every time you fight a battle and you win, you're stronger than you were before. Remember, you heard the saying, if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger? Yeah. I'm here to tell you it's not gonna kill you, so guess what it's gonna do? It's gonna make you stronger, amen? Yeah. Amen, absolutely. So, and, uh, and it's gonna be opportunities to reach out to people who are in need, opportunities to grow your faith, opportunities to take part in this great revival that's coming, amen? Oh, how do I know when it's gonna start? When you get busy. When you get busy, that's when it's gonna start. And it's already started in my life. Yeah. But see, uh, see, this great revival isn't a group of people, it's all individuals deciding to stand up and be a witness for Christ in their community. And as a corporate, it begins, to, it's like a fire. There's a whole bunch of coals, it's not just one coal, but all those coals together make a big bonfire, right? So each one of us, as we light ourselves up and get fired up on the inside of us, then we create what is called this revival. Amen? So the more coals on it, the bigger it's gonna get. 
All right, so, and like I said, I told you about several principles and all this, so again, for Victorious, and it's all about equipping you. <clears throat> equipping you for what? And that's the, that's the series I'm getting into now, spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. What, you mean spiritual warfare? Yeah, spiritual warfare. Because here's the thing you have to understand. You're in war right now, whether you realize it or not. You're in a battle right now, whether you realize it or not. Because you're in this world, and you have an enemy, and he's going after you. And so, the more you realize, and the more you begin to equip yourself, the more you'll be able to be victorious in things, okay? Um, I talked about having a heart of a servant. Remember that? I talked about having a heart of a servant and serving God. And um, one of the scriptures that I shared concerning that is the example of Paul's heart. And I want to read that scripture to you again. It's in 2 Timothy 4, 6. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I want to stop there for just a second. <clears throat> now, Paul knew that he was about to die. That's why he wrote this. He knew he was about to die. And so, I wonder what it would be like for a Christian that knew they were about to die, but hadn't run their course. It'd be like, I got to go out and do a few things before I go, <laughs> right? I got to get busy and at least get something done before I go now. So now you're in a hurry, right? Yeah, because you, you, you didn't do anything during your time, and now you got to hurry. But see, Paul, Paul said he had, he had run his course. See, there's the difference. See, he looked and realized, okay, I've done all that God asked me to do. That's quite a statement, quite a statement. I poured out as a drink offering, the time of my departure at hands, I fought the good fight. I finished the race, and this is what he said, I kept the faith. I kept the faith. That's a testimony, amen? Amen, amen. amen. that's a testimony, I kept the faith. I want to be able to say that when it's my time. Because we're all going to leave this earth either in a rapture or in death, one or the other. Amen? But I want to know that I can be able to say that same thing. I kept the faith. Okay, look what else he said. Finally, verse 8, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, righteous judge, will give to me on that day. Stop there for a second. Remember I talked about crowns. Crowns represent authority and power. And I talked to you about how it, that, it, that what we're doing here on this earth is preparing us for what we're going to do in eternity. Okay, it's preparing us for what we're going to do in eternity. So that crown he's talking about isn't just a, a reward. It's not just a reward. I'm telling you, you know what the reward is? That he would give you a crown that represents authority that he's placed in you. You know why? He trusts you. You know what? That's, that, to me, is my reward. That he would look at me and say, I trust you. Now, I'm going to make you ruler over much because you were faithful over a little. Amen? That's a reward. Crown, uh, jewels, I don't care. The city is made out of jewels. That'd be like saying, I'm going to reward you with asphalt. Right? Gold, the streets are made of that. Who cares? Right? It's not. It's, 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 and it's not about bragging rights either because of what you did on the earth. Come on. Because if that's the case, then, then you've missed it totally because it's God that does the work through you, not you. And you know that. I'm preaching to the choir here. I get that. Okay? So what does the crown represent? It represents his appreciation and his acknowledgement that you are worthy and that you're faithful and that you have the ability to do something more for him in eternity. Come on. Amen? That's the reward. The look in his eyes when he says, hey, there's somebody I can trust. Here, put this crown on because i got ten cities. Because you've got to remember, we're going to leave, then we're going to come back, and for a thousand years we're going to rule and reign with him on the earth. Who are we going to rule and reign over? I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but who are you going to rule and reign over? The people that survived the, the tribulation. There's still going to be people on the earth that didn't take the mark of the beast. They went out and hid out in the mountains and stuff like that. You know, they didn't get killed in all the turmoil. There's still going to be people on the earth. Right? And Christ is going to come back and set up his kingdom on the earth for a thousand years. And we're going to rule and reign with him. Because the people are still going to need mayors and governors and, you know, whatever, however it's set up, right? Absolutely. So, 
what position are you, are you uh, applying for in eternity, right? Amen? I'm trying to apply for the best position I can get, amen? Because I want to honor him. It's not about power struggles. I want to be powerful in a thousand years. It's about honoring him, amen? And if, you, and if it's not about that, believe me, you won't get it because he looks at your heart. Remember the talents? He gave one, I, th- I keep getting it wrong, it's either two or three and then five. But anyway, say three. He gave them according to their ability. But the one that had three multiplied three, the one that had five multiplied five, right? But both of them got the same reward. Well done, good and faithful servant. I'll make you ruler over much, see? So, so it just matters of whatever God's called you to, amen? That's the important thing, okay? So, but Paul said here he's fought the good fight, right? Um, now, I, I didn't finish verse, verse 8. Uh, the righteous judge will give me on that day, not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Amen, that's us. That's us, amen? Okay, so he, notice he said he, he fought the good fight. What kind of fight? Evidently, he was in a fight. That's warfare. Absolutely. He fought the good fight of faith. And so again, like I said, you're in a fight whether you realize it or not, okay? So, and I, you know, I, like I said, I've already talked to you about how we, we're already living in eternity. So, I'll read another scripture to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And I'll stop there and, I, and most of you have heard me explain this scripture to you, but people online won't, so I'm going to do it again. The word there, cre- new creation, that word creation is something that never existed before. He didn't, he didn't remake you a human being again. He remade you into something that never existed before. Okay? If you look at a container, whatever that container is, you can tell that it's meant to hold something. And sometimes you can tell what it's meant to hold, okay? If it's, if it's an enclosed container with an open top, you know that it can hold liquid or something that won't spill out, right? Maybe you're, it's something that, that, that has a mesh on it. Maybe it's meant to hold, you know, something like hay on a farm or something, right? In other words, oftentimes you can tell that it's meant to hold something. That new creation, if you look at it, was meant to house something. You follow me? It's different. It was made differently. Why? Because it had to be able to contain something that no container had ever held before. The Holy Spirit. See, nobody had the the indwelling of the Holy Spirit until the day of Pentecost. That's when new birth happened, right? It prepared us so that we could receive the Holy Spirit on the inside of us to be a part of us forever. Forever. See, you used to be spirit, soul, and body. Now you're spirit, soul, body, and Holy Spirit on the inside of you. The Holy Spirit doesn't leave you. He stays on the inside of you. He's with you even when you die and go to heaven. He's still there in you, right? So that's that new creation. I'm getting to something. That's why I'm bringing this up. So now here you have you. You're a new creation. You house the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, okay? And you're, but you're still on this earth. We'll go on, Okay. Verse 18, now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry, ministry of reconciliation. We have a job. He didn't say some of us. He didn't say pastors only or, or evangelists only or teachers. No, he said he'd given us, all of us, a ministry of reconciliation. That's sharing Christ with other people so they can be reconciled to God too. Amen? Not one of us can, 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 can get out from the responsibility that's placed on us. If you're born again, you have a ministry of reconciliation. Okay? Let's go on. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. God was in Christ. And what he was doing was he was reconciling the world to himself not imputing their trespasses to them, has committed to us the word of reconciliation. The Holy Spirit's on the inside of us. What's he doing? Reconciling the world to himself. See, the Holy Spirit on the inside of you's job is to help you to do the same thing that the God inside Jesus was doing, and that's reconciling himself to the world. Can somebody say amen? Amen. 
Amen? So that's what's happening. That's why the Holy Spirit didn't come into your life just so you can just be comforted or taught. He's there to do a job. And I wonder just how much we have not even allowed him to do that, that we've quenched the Spirit in our life. I said this before I started the sermon. Jesus Christ and the call of God in your life has to be the number one priority in your life. What do you spend your time doing the most of? That's the question. Whatever you spend your time mostly doing, that's what you're committed to. Okay? It's a fact. You're here on this earth for a purpose, and it's not just to, it's not just to raise your family. It's not just to have fun. It's not just to work on your job. It's the ministry of reconciliation. All those other things go along with it. Amen? Amen. Okay. Reconcile the world to himself, not, uh, and, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. What does that word pleading mean? Begging, doesn't it? You mean the God of the universe has to beg you to get off your butt? And I'm not going to delete that from the sermon. The God of the universe has to, do, has to beg you to do something for him? If that's you, shame on you. Talk about not valuing the price that was paid for the salvation of your soul. Amen? I know I'm getting rough here, but you know, this is serious business because there are people out there dying and going to hell. And you know what? I found out that's not a good place. Amen? It's not. This is really serious stuff, guys. It really is. I remember, I got a little rabbit trail here for a second. I remember I was going to a leadership conference up in Seattle one time, and this minister came to the church, and he was one of the big, a big church back east, 10,000 people in this church. And he said that he realized that a huge majority of them were just there for the show, that they weren't being discipled, that they were there because it was easy to come and sit and enjoy the music and everything and then go home. They weren't really making disciples. Disciples means disciplined ones, training them, right? So he says, I begin to start preaching hard like I do here, right? How I, I challenge you guys all the time. He says, I started preaching hard messages, demanding that they get off their rear and do something for God. And he says, we went down to about 4,000 people. But I stuck with it. He says, now we're back up to eight. But there are 8,000 people that are dedicated to doing something for God. Amen. Yeah. Why did he lose those 6,000? Because they weren't ready to do what we're talking about here. Amen. So I, I, don't make an, I don't make an apology for preaching hard sometimes, right? So because I want, you to, I want you to stand in front of God, in front of Jesus, and see a look of appreciation on his face for you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, so, all right. So anyway, it says in verse 20, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. The word ambassador there is the same like what we talk about ambassadors for the United States. You represent a kingdom. That means you're not subject to the laws on this earth. Right? In other words, um, the laws of physics says you can't walk on water. But you're not subject to that law. Peter walked on water. Jesus walked on water. Amen? And if you had enough faith, you could do the same thing. Okay? So you're not subject to, to the laws. Of course, you're subject to the governmental laws of our country. Don't get me wrong. You know that. But I'm just saying, though, is that, that you're, you're, you have diplomatic immunity. Come on, you have diplomatic immunity in this earth, in spiritual matters, amen? You're not subject to the enemy. You're not subject to his demand. You're not subject to the influence of the enemy. You can rise above it, amen? amen. And you represent the kingdom of God. But it says, although God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So we know that we have this ministry. We are called to do this, right? Let's go on. John 15, 16. Because I'm setting the stage for something here. John 15, 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you. 
and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Now think about this. Now remember the parable of the terrors? The, the talents, I mean? Okay. He chose three people. They all had talent, and they had the ability to do what he asked them to do. Even the one that had one, he had the ability to at least multiply one more because he gave it to them according to their ability, it says, right? Absolutely. So he says here, I've chose you and appointed you. Why? He knows you can do it. Come on, somebody. He knows you can do it. Okay. Andre, you're my ameneer. Okay, every once in a while I want you to shout amen, okay? Because I need some noise in here a little bit, okay? He chose you and appointed you because he knew you could do it. Amen. 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 All right. Amen. Thank you. All right, thank you guys. Okay, anyway, think about that. He knows you can do it. You might doubt yourself, but he does, God doesn't doubt you. Think about that, guys. Let it explode in your mind a little bit here. God believes in you, okay, and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. The devil's not going to take that fruit out of your hands. He's not going to be able to rob you of it. Amen? Come on. And whatever you, oh my gosh, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. In other words, according to my nature, because you're taking on my nature, you're learning and growing, your whole thought pattern, your whole life is dedicated to the call of God on your life. You love people, you have the love of God operating on the inside of you. Love never fails, right? So you're taking on the very nature of God, amen? You were supposed to be partakers of his divine nature, right? So you start doing that, and then, you, then your fruit, you begin, you're bearing fruit. And when all that happens, that's when he says, when you ask something in my name, but what is it that you're asking in his name? Things that go along with bearing fruit. You're, you're praying for people that they might be saved, that their eyes might be opened to see the gospel. Amen? You're praying for people to be healed, and you see them healed. You're operating, Jesus operated with compassion. He says he, he had compassion, and he healed the people. See, that's part of his nature. You take on that same compassion, and you're operating in that, things begin to happen, because you're not asking. James says you, you have not, because you ask not, because you ask what? Amiss, to consume it on your own lust. Maybe it's time you quit praying over your finances. Not that you shouldn't if you're hurting, but I'm not saying that. But if it's all about your needs, if that's what you're so focused on the most, then your heart's not in the right place. Go, go start ministering to people. God's gonna equip you, amen? amen. And that includes finances too. I'll tell you what, if he asks you to go across town and pray for somebody, go make sure you have gas in your car to do it. Yeah. Come on, amen? amen? Amen. Okay, so, that your fruit should remain. Whatever you ask the Father, he'll give it. Verse 17, these things I command you, that you love one another. Why, he's, start, he's talking about his nature there, his character. If the world hates you, now we're getting into where I'm going with this today, okay? If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. Now why is the world gonna start hating you? because you're operating a different value system than they are. Come on, you're operating a different value system. I've just been shadow banned on, on Facebook because evidently I said a few things that uh, the, uh, the uh, fact checkers didn't care for. First time, I'm proud of it. Yeah, I'm proud of it. I really am, cool. As a matter of fact, I remember about a year ago, I know somebody that's, that's been shadow banned and, and, and banned on Facebook four or five times, and I was thinking, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> so finally, I got it, yeah. They hate you because you're not of them. Verse 19, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. You're not of the world, remember? You're a new creation, and you're an ambassador. It doesn't love you because you're not its own anymore. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Verse 20, isn't this good? God, isn't, isn't this good, good stuff, guys? Come on. Verse 20, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll also persecute you. If they kept my word, they'll keep yours also. I remember I was praying. Here's another rabbit trail. 
as pastors, and every pastor out there would absolutely totally understand what I'm talking about, if they have the heart of a pastor, people come into our church, Pastor Johanna and I, we love them. We love you guys. You become p part of our family in our heart, and your kids become like grandkids to us. They really do. And, and unfortunately, people leave, and they take my grandkids with them. And it hurts. It does. It hurts. And, and, and sometimes on Facebook, I'll see people that I have left the church, maybe they were in the church even 10 years ago, and now their kids are teenagers or, or, or getting married, right? And I'm thinking, I wanted to be a part of that. I wanted to be a part of that. It's, it's almost the same as if one of my own kids decided we're not going to be a part of your family anymore and you don't get to see your grandkids anymore. Be honest, I'm just being open with you. I've never talked like this before. But, yeah, that's what it feels like, honestly. Because we love you. And we love the people that come here. And we love your kids. Okay? So, and the, re and the reason I'm bringing this up is this. Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they would persecute you also. So I was, I was in a point, this was about a year and a half ago, I think, something like that, or maybe a year ago, and one of those people's daughter got married, and we weren't invited to the wedding. And I'm not gonna say who, of course, but it, it kind of hurt, because we would have been there. We would have been there, okay? And, and so I was really depressed that day, and I was just praying, and, and the Lord reminded me, he said this to me, he says, I'm the son of God. I gave them promises of eternal life I gave them promises beyond their wildest imaginations, and they still left me. They all had deserted Jesus. He got down to the 12, and he looked at them and said, are you going to leave too? To me, that's the saddest scripture in the entire Bible, because I know Jesus was sad when he's, for him to say that to his disciples, think about it. He says, are you going to leave too? Wow. Oh, my gosh. I cry when I think about it, guys. But he said to me, he says, they left me. And if they would leave me, what makes you think they wouldn't leave you? Right? Yeah. Amen. Amen. So here's the thing. If they persecute Jesus, if you make a stand for God, they're going to persecute you. They're going to reject you. And the thing is, people don't like to be rejected. I get that. Okay? But here's the thing. They're going to reject you anyway. And Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me before men, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father. Ouch, I do not want that. Amen? Yeah. Amen. If I'm going to be rejected by somebody, I'd rather be rejected by people and accepted by God. Yeah. Come on, amen? amen. You're not, you, you, you don't get to, you don't get both. You don't get both, guys. End of story, you don't get both. You have to decide which one you want. Amen? And so that's what it comes down to, and that's, that's, that's what we're talking about here. Verse 21, but all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. They don't understand, they're blind. You can still love them, don't get me wrong, because he loves them, but just understand they're rejecting you because they're really rejecting Christ. <coughs> Amen? They're rejecting what you stand for. All right? So anyway, you're going against the flow of the world, and, and you're going to get opposition. John 17. Verse 14, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray for you. I do not pray. He's, ta he's praying to his Father, of course. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Now, who's he talking about here? I'll tell you in just a second. You'll, you'll see it in a second. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Sanctify means to set aside for a specific purpose. Okay? As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself. I set myself aside. He set himself aside for a specific use, to die for you. Right? That they also may be sanctified by the truth. Verse 20. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe on me through their word. There you are, that's you. He's praying for us. He specifically prayed for you because he mentioned you there because he knew down through the ages, down through the ages, 
Edward's going to happen to know this, that he saw him through the ages, that you were going to be born, and he says, I've got to make sure I include it in there so that Edward knows, so that Laura knows, so that you online knows that he was so, so thinking of you. It wasn't just his disciples he was praying for here. He's mentioning them, he's talking about them, but then he goes on to mention this because he wants to make sure you know he had you in mind also. Okay, that they may all be one, that's us too, all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, which I have given them, they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Now you notice he said the glory which, uh, which you gave me. At the beginning of John 17, he says, Now, Father, the glory that I had with you before, before the worlds were created, he, he, he asked for it back. That glory he's talking about was that the existence that him and the Father and the Holy Spirit had, and that existence was face to face, total, absolute communion, nothing held back, total knowledge of each other, everything, all their thoughts jived together, their heartbeats were one, amen? And then he set that aside to come to the earth and die for us. Then he says, Father, give me that glory back. So he brought that glory back to himself. Then he turned around and he said, the Father, the glory you gave me, I give them. What does that mean? He wants you to know that you have the ability, the, 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 the um, potential, the access, free of charge, to enter into the Holy of Holies, to enter into the very face of God and have communion with Him just like they did before the creation of the world. We're not talking about the Holy of Holies like in the Old Testament where the glory of God was over the ark. No, we're talking about back before the worlds were even created. He said, that glory, that's the glory I want them to have. Why? So that they may be one. Try to separate the Godhead. You can't do it. That's why there's so much commun uh, confusion over, was there one God or three? Oh, I believe in the Trinity. I don't believe in the Trinity. There's only one. Why? Because there's so much one yet three that people can't, they can't comprehend that there's actually three separate identities there, but you're still considered one. But now, there's more than three. There's thousands, millions over these years. You and I, and all the people that believed on, on them through the word of the disciples that we have right here, our Bible. Amen? That you have the ability to actually walk into the very presence of God and get right in his face. Amen? When we were at worship this, this morning, my granddaughter came up to me, and, she, and I was holding her, and then she grabbed my face, and Nic I would talk about Nicole having done this when she was a baby, but my granddaughter did it today. She grabbed my face and turned it toward her and looked at me. God wants you to do that, and that touched my heart. You know, God wants you to do that. Yeah. He wants you to go climb up in his lap. What's it say? Come boldly to the throne of grace. Yeah. Not timidly, not, oh my gosh, God's so big, I'm so small. No, no. boldly to the throne of grace. Climb up in his lap. Even if he's busy, grab his face and turn it towards you and put your nose right on his nose. And you know what you're going to get? A smile. And you're going to see love in his eyes because he knows there's somebody that just simply wants me, not for what I can give them. They simply want me. Amen. Amen. I have so much more to share with you, but I'm going to stop there for now, and I'll continue this next week. Amen? Amen. But you have to understand that, and I was setting the stage for some things I want to share with you. We're getting into spiritual warfare, and I'm not going to show, I'm going to show you that there are at least four different avenues of warfare in your, that you're fighting, whether you know it or not, and how to overcome in each one. Amen? So we're going to get into spiritual warfare. And then I'll also be teaching out of Ephesians chapter 6, the armor that you have on. Amen. And, and, and all this. It's going to be some really good stuff. Amen, guys? Amen. Amen. So go ahead and stand up. I'm going to go ahead and stop there for now um, because it's getting late.